Good evening, everybody. Back so soon? Yes, indeed. Um, I'm hoping that uh, all you good folk out there will uh, be able to share your opinion with me on uh, this particular subject. It's something that's been uh, um, scratching away at the back of my mind for quite a while now. Um, some of you will have heard me on a video where I play the accordion. I play a tune called Call Me by Tony Hatch. In fact, I will put the link in the comment immediately below the, uh, the video. Yeah, as I say, a tune called Call Me by Tony Hatch. Tony Hatch was very famous in the UK as being a judge of music competitions, singing competitions on TV in order to find new talent long, long before Simon Cowell came along. Tony Hatch was the original Simon, Simon Cowell. He was always brutally honest, but always correct. Now, Sean Atwood, in his most recent Making a Murderer video, that was the one he did before his chat with Eric Cozy. In it, he pointed out that the time has come to question, is it merely enough to go through the legal process the way that the conventional lawyers do? These processes that can last decades. Certainly in the case of Brendan Dassey, but... I'm sure he's referring to Stephen Avery as well. He likened the situation as being that the corrupt state is sitting in their castle, laughing down on those of us that want our kidnapped captives returned and using corrupt judges as their defence. In the staircase, Orlando Hudson famously claimed that in the case of Mike Peterson, in hindsight, he would have not allowed Jim Harding the leeway that he did. But it was only the discrediting of Dwayne Deaver that ultimately brought about the release of Mike Peterson. It had nothing to do with his legal system working correctly, as he claimed. Now, but for the exposing of Dwayne Diva as the charlatan that he was, Mike Peterson would still be wrongfully incarcerated. So, if the normal processes aren't working, surely a more aggressive approach is required. Now, one question that always crops up at presentations by Steve Drizzen and Laura Nyrider is this. When Stephen Avery is released, will Brendan Dassey also be set free? The answer is no, not immediately. They would be lodging their appeal to have Brendan Dassey released immediately, but there's no saying how long that could be. In Making a Murder 2, we notice that Kathleen Zellner is quite critical of the defence performance at the Arnbank hearing that they left a lot, or a bit, sorry, not a lot, but they left a bit behind. They didn't, they didn't bat back everything that should have been. Now, I would agree that, in that instance, Laura Nyrider was not dealt with fairly by Hamilton and the rest. But as Kathleen Zellner pointed out, she would have countered their arguments. And I can quite honestly tell you, somebody else that could have quite easily have gone in and batted bat back all of the judges' arguments would have been 
the likes of Eric Ozy. He knows the case inside out as well as anyone. <laughs> Talking of Eric Ozy, I would have liked to have heard about the control question at all the presentations I've been to. I thought that they were just about to on a couple of occasions, but did not. If they had have covered the control question, for me that would have been more living up to the billing of the presentation, the billing of looking inside making a murderer, not simply recapping on stuff that we've now known since watching a making a murderer for over three years. Kathleen Zellner, in two presentations, is mentioned once. Um, by David Rudolph, there's a bit of a joke. Street Dresden points out that the Centre for Wrongful Convictions has 50 exonerees. To which David Rudolph quipped, that's more than Kathleen Zellner. Now, it's been suggested that uh, Steve and Laura have refrained from talking to, and it, talking about Kathleen Zellner and her ongoing investigation into the disappearance of Teresa out of respect for Brendan, now that Brendan's own brother is one of the main suspects and they don't want to hurt Brendan by discussing his own brother. Now as far as I'm aware, Steve Drizzen and Laura Nyrider have only looked at the habeas route in order to try and get Brendan free. And of course ultimately they were shut down by SCOTUS. As far as I know they haven't looked into trying to identify the real killer or killers. It seems that they've left that to Kathleen Zellner. I also wonder if maybe Kathleen Zellner has ruffled a few fed feathers within the lawyer community, many of whom are actually quite content with the snail-like process. Now, Brendan himself has always insisted that Stephen Avery had nothing to do with the disappearance of Teresa, that he is completely innocent. But of course, with Steve and Laura exercising a certain amount of silence with regards to Kathleen Zellner and Stephen Avery, this is fueled a little bit of speculation that somehow they might believe that Stephen Avery is guilty. I certainly don't believe that is the case. But I would certainly hope that following Scotus's decision not to look at the case, that Brendan's team will look at who the real perpetrator might be. My own uh, suspicion, my own personal opinion, is that the establishment doesn't really care for the brashness of Kathleen Zellner. They don't care for her, her honesty and the way that she does things. I've already dealt with her, the way she deals with the media. I think it's completely apt and appropriate the way she does. As I say, at what point do we begin to realise that these processes of trying to get wrongfully convicted people out of prison are just far, far too long. That too often corruption can hide behind the judges. Um, I do think 
that uh, perhaps Steve and Laura will try and distance themselves from Kathleen Zellner until Steve and Avery is freed, of course. I suspect that they weren't too pleased at Kathleen Zellner's honest assessment of the performance of the defence of the at the arm bank hearing that she mentioned in uh, Making a Murder Number Two. Um, as I say, I'm not trying to provoke. Huh, I'm certainly not trying to provoke an argument here. Um, I just find it interesting that, uh, you know, having watched now three presentations by Steve and Laura, that there seems to be a contrived silence. Um, if we're presenting a show looking inside making a murderer, I would point out who is the main character in this, Stephen Avery. With all respect, obviously, to our victim, Teresa, and of course the families, and of course the collateral damage to Brendan, making a murder is fundamentally about Stephen Avery. Um, and I would just hope that, as I say, that we would hear certainly a bit more in-depth about Brendan's case with um, some acknowledgement of the control question as being a particularly um, interesting aspect of the case. Stephen and Laura could do far worse than speaking with Eric Ozy about the control question. He certainly knows his stuff when it comes to Brendan. Anyway, um, as I said, I'm I don't want to seem to be as if I'm here just to stir the pot. As a lot of you will know, I like to send that message to uh, various people with the, the Muppet Swedish chef saying, just here to stir the pot. No, that's, that's not what I'm trying to do. Um, I would like to try and start a, a discussion about this um, and, and see what, what other people think about it. Um, as I say, I just I just find it a a curious situation, um, and one that when we have our little chat on Saturday with the with the other guys, the other dudes, um, certainly don't want this to be an item that uh, that, that, that merits a lot of discussion. Um, we've had our own discussions about it, and uh, as I say that's the reason why I've partly the reason why I've gone ahead and done a, a little video about it. Um, as I say, I'd, I would, would, would really like to hear from, uh, from, from other people, from you people out there, about your thoughts on uh, Steve and Laura's uh, apparent silence when it comes to Kathleen Zellner. Okay, we'll catch you again soon. Bye for now.